Magic in the Early Modern Spain, Part 1. Hi, this is Dr. Cruz Peterson, and, and welcome to this week's lesson. We will um, be reviewing or talking about Maria de Sayas and her novellas. Um, but first, let's just talk a little bit about the author herself. The life of Maria de Sayas, also known as Maria de Sayas y Sotomayor, remains largely a mystery. The only facts known about her are that she lived in Madrid during the first half of the 17th century and was a recognized literary figure. It is believed that she belonged to nobility, but unfortunately, the only contemporary references to Sayas pertain to her literary activity. Her works were highly acclaimed by such notable uh, contemporaries, such as the prolific playwright Lope de Vega, who praised, and I quote, her rare and unique genius. The first such mention occurs in 1621. There is no further reference to her after the publication of her second volume of novellas in 1647. The dates and places of her birth and death are pretty much unknown to us. So the only physical description of Sayas, which was likely made in jest, comes from Francesc Fontanella. This uh, poem, and I'll read it to you now, Madame Maria de Sayas, she lived with a manly face, with a great skirt she had, what great skirt she had, mustaches spinning high. She resembled a gentleman, but I have just come to discover that she poorly hides a sword underneath the feminine skirt. So there's a lot of play with words. There are a lot of plays with, uh, there's a lot of play with words here with um, the, um, manly face and the mustache is spinning high uh even the resemble the gentleman how is it that we're looking at in which ways is it, does she resemble the gentleman is it physically or by reason the man um and his skill his mental skills um also the playing with the word the sword and um and again the feminine skirt so this description of Saya's leads some to believe this photo of a masculine looking woman that you see here on the screen to be that of Sayas. According to Patsy Boyer, the translator of the uh, first volume of books, The Enchantments of Love, uh, and I quote, with so little known about Sayas's life, it is no wonder that scholars have set forth an amazing amount of conjecture about this intriguing woman. Interpreting statements made by characters in the novellas, critics have debated whether Sayas was ugly or beautiful. And this is a photo here that uh, we uh, scholars have not been able to determine uh, who it is, and it was uh, taken at the time that Maria de Sayas lived. Or whether she married, remained a spinster, or suffered a devastating love affair and took refuge in a convent like so many of her characters. What stands out is that Maria de Sayas was a remarkable woman for her time and is acknowledged by scholars as one of the foremost writers of Spain's golden age. She is among the first secular women writers in Spain and certainly the first to achieve such great fame. So the first volume, Novelas Amorosas, uh, or Novelas Ejemplares y Amorosas, or Amorous and Exemplary Novels, published in 1637 is modeled on one of Miguel's um, de Cervantes exemplary uh, novels written in 1612. You may be familiar with Cervantes' um, novel, The Don Quixote, which was written in part one in 1605 and part two in 1615. Considered the first novel or modern novel, uh, Don Quixote has been translated into at least 50 languages and is deemed the best-selling novel of all time. Some experts believe its sales far exceed Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities and Tolkien's Lord of the Rings trilogy. But returning to Cervantes' exemplary novels, this volume contains a series of 12 novellas that follow the model established in Italy by the 14th century Italian author and humanist Giovanni Boccaccio. Giovanni Boccaccio uh, wrote a collection of novellas entitled The Decameron, structured as a frame story containing 100 tales told by a group of seven young women and three young men sheltering in a secluded villa just outside Florence to escape the Black Death, which was afflicting the city at the time. 
In Maria de Sayas's amorous and exemplary novels, ten men and women participate in an elaborate retreat or soiree, taking turns narrating, uh, and I quote, true stories. The ten novellas are placed within a central frame that unifies the tales. During the um, 16th and 17th centuries, the Inquisition uh, censored all printed materials, deciding what were appropriate in, for print. And even though Sias's works depicted violence against women, the Inquisition censors found nothing contrary to their, and I quote, holy faith and decent customs in these novellas. In fact, the priest who approved the publication of her work and also worked as an Inquisition uh, censor applauded Zayas's no novella, uh, stating, and I quote, I rather see in it a refuge where feminine weakness, assailed by flattering importunities, can take shelter in a mirror of what man needs in order to direct his actions properly. Science incorporates truth and honesty as part of the formula for storytelling, an important component that ensures the publication of her books uncensored by the Inquisition. In fact, during my research in Seville, Spain, I found her books listed among the readings approved by the Inquisition for shipment to the New World in the late 1600s. In 1647, Maria de Sayas publishes a second volume of short stories, Desengaños Amorosos, or Disenchantments of Love. However, in contrast to the first volume, only women narrate the stories. Sayas' novellas became instant bestsellers in Spain and remained so for 200 years, rivaled only by Cervantes' novellas in popularity. Pretty impressive, right? Sayas arms the true enchanter with positive attributes. But before we go on, which sorceress best fits Lucrecia from Maria de Sayas' story? Is it the old hag or the younger, more beautiful witch? Actually, this is a trick question, and you would know what I mean um, after you've read the story. Um, Maria de Sayas, uh, again, as I was saying, arms the witch with positive attributes, calling her the astute Lucrecia, who was a good woman, a native of Rome, who was as clever in Spanish as if she had been born um, and brought up in Old Castile, which is the, the modern Madrid. Lucrecia, who in spite of her age, was very attractive. Her appeal was enchanted by the great wealth she possessed and had increased in Rome and in the other countries where she traveled. The narrator stresses the difference between this witch and those before her. She carefully describes Lucrecia's uh, knowledge of witchcraft, saying, and I quote, everywhere this good woman went, she had become known as a powerful witch, but not everybody knew it because she never exercised her powers on behalf of others, only for the good, only for herself. Lucrecia is a person full of life, and passion, whose main weakness was falling madly in love with her friend's lover, a sharp contrast to the Celestinas depicted in contemporary literature, that of an old, ugly woman who relied on the amorous trysts of others for their deceitful behaviors. Um, in the medieval and Renaissance periods, to appease the appetite of the reader for the spectacular, the appearance of the magical ring and fantastical miracles increase in literature and in plays about saints. Adopting an attitude of condemnation towards magic, these works consider the uh, concept of witchcraft as a pact with the devil. In Spanish classics, like Juan Ruiz's El Libro de Buen Amor, or The Book of Good Love, written in 1330, and Fernando de Rojas' La Celestina o Tragicomedia, written in 1499, the authors associate the witch with the devil. In The Book of Good Love, a fictitious autobiography in which uh, the author recounts his conquests with women, an old woman named Trota Conventos, literally translated to Trots Between monasteries, 
often helps him by seemingly hypnotizing her master's lovers by means of a ring with magical powers. By the way, this is a portrait by Picasso, Pablo Picasso, done, I think, in uh, the early 1900s, 1903 or so, of La Celestina. Um, so they use this uh, this magical ring, right, uh, to hypnotize their lovers, or in La Celestina, a tragic comedy about two lovers, an old prostitute named Celestina manipulates her subjects through magic potions. Both female characters are endowed with black magic uh, powers for the purpose of personal greed or with the intent to harm another. In contrast, Maria de Sayas, um, in her novella, Disillusionment of Love and Virtue Rewarded, creates a strong female character who uses supernatural powers of her own free will. Sayas not only shatters the subjugated image of the witch possessed by the devil, but by naming her after the Roman mythological Lucrecia, Sayas also subverts the one-dimensional archetype of the virgin mythology, that of a passive and obedient girl or wife, spiritually immaculate and eternally giving. According to Elizabeth Storrs, the author of The Tales of Ancient Rome, women who were second-class citizens in Rome were expected to be chaste if single or faithful if married. Uh, still a, 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 a belief in the time of Maria de Sayas. And if a woman had an affair, her husband or father was entitled to kill his wife or daughter. They could also kill them if they deemed a woman's honor had been sullied, regardless of whether she was innocent or guilty of the act that may have constituted her, and I quote, corruption. This covered the spectrum from a girl being discovered alone with, with a man without a chaperone to the commission of a rape. Once a woman's sexual purity had been compromised, her blood became tainted. According to legend, Lucretia was married to the Roman uh, to a Roman nobleman who boasted that Lucretia was more virtuous than Etruscan wives. So Sextus, the son of the Etruscan king, visited Lucretia to test his claim. Holding his sword to her throat, he demanded that she sleep with him. When she refused, he threatened to kill not only her, but also leave the corpse of a dead, of a naked slave beside her so that her husband in all Rome would think she had committed adultery with a servant. To avoid bringing such shame upon her husband, Lucretia yielded to Sextus. The next day, even though her husband was prepared to forgive Lucretia for her blood taint, she took her own life rather than live with dishonor. Her defilement and self-sacrifice incited the Romans to rise up and rid Rome of their oppressive and depraved Etruscan rulers by expelling the king. After this, the Romans vowed never again to um, be governed by a monarch, and the Republic of Rome was born. From the beginning of the story, um, in, uh, Lucretia subverts, in, in Maria de Sayas' story I'm talking about, Lucretia subverts the image of the Roman Lucretia by playing the role of the seductress as opposed to the woman seduced. Lucretia relies on her natural charm to re, uh, seduce Fernando. She writes him a letter in which she declares her affections for him, offering to take care of him in more ways than one. Fernando, being a young man, more inclined toward mischief and vice than toward virtue, could not resist her offer and the affair begins. This concludes part one of Magic in Early Modern Spain. Please go on if you have not done so already and read Disillusionment of Love and Virtue Rewarded by Maria de Sayas, and then watch the video, The Myth of the Spanish Inquisition on YouTube, which will give you some insight about um, the Inquisition at the time by Maria de Sayas. Uh, after you've watched that video, please watch and listen to the second part of this lecture, which is Magic in Early Modern Spain, Part 2. Thank you.